Welcome to Waterside Home Church. We are meeting in homes in multiple locations, in multiple states and multiple countries. Today is a very special day as we join in worship and to hear the word. Number one, you can see that we've changed our environment. We are in the piano room of Larry and my home. Join us as we celebrate Resurrection Day the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have special guests with us this evening, excellent musicians, and the disciplines of their gifts are going to take us into the presence of the Lord in a very special way. So now, let's lift our hearts before him. Amen, amen. We worship you, Jesus. We thank you, Father for making a way and for always working, Father. We thank you. You work all things, Jesus. Join with us tonight as we lift up the name of Jesus above every other name. Yeah. 
let's declare tonight, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working.
let's declare that miracles happen. Miracles happen when you move. Healing is coming in this room. Miracles happen when you move. Come on, let's call upon heaven right now. One more time. on you, Father, and what you did, Father, for us on that cross. Thank you, Jesus. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, he laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name.
and I will rise among the saints. My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Come on, if you could close your eyes right where you're at and just fix your gaze on Jesus and thank Him. Just say, thank you, Jesus. Just worship Him and say, I worship you, Lord. Just love Him and say, I love you, Lord. Thank you for taking the sacrifice for me, Jesus. We thank you, Father, that you made a way where there seemed to be no way, Lord. You bring hope to the hopeless. We thank you, Jesus. Come on, keep worshiping Him. Keep worshiping right where you're at. We thank you, Jesus. days we will sing his praise I, I just can't my, my eyes have not stopped watering since John began singing this song I just can't imagine I, I can't imagine the sepulcher the king of glory in that cold cold tomb I can't imagine the shame that he endured. I can't imagine literally going to hell for our sakes so that we wouldn't have to go there. My mind, it can't conceive of such love. The Bible says in Hebrews 2.14 said, through death, he conquered death. I want you to just think it. This is not my sermon, by the way. But it is a sermon, so I'm going to preach it right now. All of those things in our lives that involve the death process, through death, you conquer death. Through death, he conquered death so that when he came out of that grave on resurrection day, you were set free, you were redeemed, you became an heir of God joined her of Jesus Christ through death. Death is never final. Never. Doesn't matter what you're experiencing, death is never final. I don't care if it's death of a vision, death of a loved one, death of anything. It is never final. Because once that seed falls into the ground, John 12, 24, and dies, it brings forth much fruit. The Bible mentions 30, 60, 100 fold, but when Jesus came out of that ground, millions and millions of people were redeemed. New life, everlasting life. You know what? Death really does not bother me. That's why this coronavirus is I, I, I'm, I'm sorry for the sorrow that it creates and the economic hardship that it creates. 
But I want you to know I'm not afraid of death. I'm very excited to see Jesus. So whether he takes me at his return or I die first, it really doesn't matter. I'm still going to be with him. If I die first, I'll beat you there. If you die first, you will beat me there. Either way, we will be envious in one way or another. I am so excited to see Jesus. But I'm also excited to see his return. That's why this day, Resurrection Day, I don't call it Easter, I call it Resurrection Day. To me, this is one of the most exciting days of the year. Do you realize, by the way, if Jesus died and did not rise again, we would not be here. Nobody would be saved. If Jesus didn't rise again, the gospel is not true. The gospel's a lie. God the Father is a liar. Jesus is a liar. The disciples are liars. We're not born again. We can't expect divine healing, miracles. We can't expect to be raised again after we die. But because it's true, because it did happen. I've been to the Holy Land 15 times, and every time I go into the garden tomb, I still have not found him. The tomb is still empty. He is not here. Why look for the living among the dead? Well, we're going to take a few minutes, give you an opportunity to be part of the ministries. If you would like to be part of our ministry, not only at Waterside Church, but globally, because we minister in dozens of nations, you're welcome to, and that information is available. Uh, just a couple days ago, I was with my mother-in-law. I love her. My wife's mother, 96 years young. And she said for her 100th birthday party, she wants us to plan for it now, and she promises that she will be there. <laughs> But she started laughing the other day because my son called. Debbie had just returned from Brazil. And uh, my son called from North Carolina concerned that Debbie might have caught something. And if she goes to visit her mother. So he calls my daughter. And evidently, grandmother is standing there because she lives with my daughter, Trina. Aaron was saying, don't let mom go see grandma. If she's got anything, it could kill her. And Debbie's mother starts laughing and laughing and laughing. She says, I'm 96. <laughs> Something is going to kill me. <laughs> she starts, I think we need to laugh in the face of death. Seriously, laugh in the face of death. You never win. You never win. I don't care what it is. You do not win. How many know resurrection wins? Death never wins. Amen? <laughs> Anyway, the real story I was going to tell you, that was just kind of a side story, was that she wanted me to pick up a check for her. I was visiting, taking in some groceries, and she said, don't leave, I've got a check, I want to give a check. And she was writing her check. She writes meticulously, 96. It amazes me she's 96. I mean, I never wrote that good. I don't care what age I was. I, I write in tongues, and... You need the gift of interpretation to see what I wrote. But she uh, was writing her check meticulously, and she said, you know, you could be indebted to a lot of things, but I don't ever want to be indebted to God. So I always put him first. Her entire life, full, full of blessing. Because she said, I will not be indebted to God. I love that spirit. I love that spirit. So anyway, people do want to invest, and we will give you the opportunity now as I'm speaking. Now behind me, this beautiful music was not me pre-recording this. I happen to have today some guests with me. Brandon on the cello, by the way, you were in... Incredible, Brandon. Incredible. Yeah, you were. Yeah, I was, but I just thought I'd share with you. Brandon and then my great niece, Deborah Titus. Oh, what a gift you are. And then Quinnell. Quinnell Gaskin. I, I've, 
when I heard him the first time about two and a half, three years ago, Debbie and I sat on the front row. He was giving a concert at the Stein, Steinway um, Music Hall in Fort Worth, Texas. And we went and we sat on the front row thinking probably it wasn't reserved for us, but we were going to take the seats real quick anyway. When he started playing, he started playing the song that I asked him to play tonight. As a musician, whenever I hear somebody play like this, I, I can't even tell you what experience I had because he was worshiping, playing this concert, giving all of the glory to Jesus. And I want him on Resurrection Day, Quinnell Gaskin, and you can, you can go on YouTube and see the many, many videos of this incredible musician, whether it be the piano or the uh, uh, organ, the B3 Hammond organ. It, it's like he's, I call him a spirit-filled alien. He is really not of this world. But Quinnell Gaskin, we have so enjoyed. Please lead us in to God be the glory. Quinnell style. Yes. 
the glory, and I'm supposed to preach after this. <laughs> to God but the glory, great things, great things, great things he has done. My goodness, I just blessed, so blessed this resurrection day. I, I really, really strongly, strongly believe that this is the entire event that has been caused, or the events that have been caused by the coronavirus. I believe God is working. I believe that God is working. Every, the reason, there are several reasons. Number one is that I believe that because he is sovereign, there is nothing that is happening by coincidence. I believe that God is preparing for the return of his son. So I believe that there are multitudes that are going to be saved. Multitudes that are going to be saved. On resurrection day, I heard the report of uh, Greg Laurie's church last week uh, from California, Southern California, had 1.5 million 
viewers, 1.5 million viewers, and over 11,000 people saved. It's amazing, amazing, amazing what God is doing. It's amazing what God is doing in this world of ours. It's amazing. God, you're amazing. <laughs> what an understatement. God is amazing. Uh, I do have some scriptures that I want to read to you. This is found in the first book of Paul to the Corinthian church. Now, this was not the first letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. It was about three letters down the line or four letters down the line. His first letter would have been to the Galatian church. Chapter 15, he says, I delivered to you as the first importance what I received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That he appeared to Cephas, meaning Simon Peter. Then he appeared to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, probably in the Galilee area, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, meaning that they died. Then he appeared to James. Now, this is not talking about James, the brother of John, son of Zebedee, is talking about the half-brother of Jesus. Then to all of the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So Paul's conversion probably was approximately two years after Jesus died and rose again. So what we know is the Damascus experience where he was saved on the road to Damascus, probably around the year 35. Jesus would have died around April 5 in the year of 33. So approximately two years later, Paul or Saul of Tarsus had an encounter with Jesus. So he's telling you in this particular portion of Scripture those who witnessed the resurrection of Jesus. Now, see, this is so important because if the resurrection can be disproved, the entire gospel fails. Everything fails. Everything fails. If this can be disproved, if we can disprove the resurrection, everything is built on a hoax, is built on a lie. And had Jesus died but not risen from the dead, as some of the religions proclaim, that they just, he just, whenever he got in the tomb, his dead body kind of resuscitated in the dampness of the tomb. Oh, please, that is the most absurd doctrine I've ever heard. After he lost every drop of blood, including a spear draining out, having pierced the heart and drained out the remaining water together with blood. For them to say that, how could you be put in a tomb in that condition? And the centurion thought he was dead. So that's why they did not break his bones. They thought he was already dead. So after six hours on the cross, and he said, it is finished, teleos. So now we come to Sunday morning. The interesting thing is not one of the disciples, none of them thought he would rise from the dead, though he told them he would. He told him, after three days, I'll rise again. He said, I will be crucified at the hands of sinful men, and then on the third day I will rise. He told everybody, and not one person believed him. So they were going to come. The women were coming first to the sepulcher early in the morning to bring additional spices. Now, they had already put a ton of spices on them. But Mary Magdalene leaning, leading the other Marys, and most assuredly, the mother of Jesus as well. Whenever she comes to bring those spices, she obviously doesn't expect him to be risen from the dead. So the very first woman, the very first person that Jesus revealed him to, himself to was this woman called Mary Magdalene from whom he had cast out seven demons. Now, people have called her like a prostitute, but the Bible doesn't call her a prostitute. It just says she was delivered from seven demons. So she and the other women from Galilee that had been at the crucifixion, 
now we're going to be bringing additional herbs and spices in which to wrap the body. She arrives just before daybreak. She begins to talk to a stranger whom she thinks is the gardener until he says her name. And she replies with the Aramaic word, Rabboni, which means rabbi, teacher. Why is that so interesting? It's because as I give to you the events chronologically, you will see the amazing nature of Jesus, who he chose to reveal himself to first was this woman. Secondly, at some point, close to this time, he was going to reveal himself to Simon Peter. Notice that it calls him Cephas, the rock. He's going to reveal himself to Simon Peter, the one who was denying him three times. Then he's going to reveal himself to two men on the way to to Emmaus, which is seven miles away. Two guys on the way to Emmaus. Why? Randomly. You got a whole bunch of people that you can do this. You got a whole, why, why, why is this random order? You're, you're going to be revealing yourself now to these two guys. One of the guys, we don't even know his name. One is Cleopas, the other one, we don't even know if it was a guy. We just assume, doesn't give the names of most of the times that the men would walk together and not the men and the women. So probably a man, Cleopas and whoever the other dude was. We don't know his name. Jesus, the ruler of the universe, when you come down, You die, you rise again, and you choose Mary Magdalene as the most important one for her to know first. Seems to me that it's as much a revelation as it was whenever Jesus sat and talked to the woman of Samaria at the well at Sychar, Jacob's well, (laughs) and reveals the fact that he's the Messiah. I love it. He doesn't go to the high and noble. He doesn't go to the exalted ones. He just finds those that are lowly and humble. And this woman has had so many husbands. And the one she's living with is not her own. And Jesus said, if you knew who was speaking to you, if you just knew who was speaking to you, I am the Messiah. And he reveals it to her. Then these two guys, one is nondescript, we don't know his name, and Cleopas, and then Simon, the one that had just messed up really good. These are the ones that Jesus reveals himself to. Now, through the day, he may have revealed himself to others. We know he revealed himself to 500 at one time, probably in Galilee, because he told the women who came to the tomb, tell The brothers, the disciples, go to Galilee. I'm going to meet them there. So he makes an appointment for them to go to Galilee. But in the scriptures that I just read, it says, and he revealed himself to James. Are you aware of the fact that James was the one that had dogged him for three and a half years as his crazy, unbalanced, lunatic brother? James. Whenever you understand who Jesus revealed himself to, it is incredible because he's still doing this today. He's still finding the people that the others would reject. It reminds me of Hagar, the angel of the Lord. By the way, that was Jesus too. The angel of the Lord finds her out of the desert and she names the name of the place. It's called the God who sees has seen me. The seeing God sees me. I love it. Such an amazing Jesus we serve. Such an amazing Jesus we serve that he would reveal himself continually to the most. You know, I I am enthralled at the testimony of Kanye West. I'm absolutely enthralled. I've heard 
Skeptics say, well, is it real? I said, he thinks it is. <laughs> and if he thinks it is, I'm going to go for his opinion because he is the one that Jesus, he said Jesus delivered him, and I believe it because that's what Jesus does. So Jesus now, the scripture I just read, because we don't read about it in the Gospels, we read it in Corinthians. So Paul saved a couple years later and then several years later goes up to Jerusalem and meets James and John and Peter, James, the half-brother of the Lord, and John, the beloved disciple or apostle, and then Peter, and spends 15 days with him. So evidently, this man called Saul of Tarsus, another, now this guy was despicable. He was not your ordinary ruffian. He was not your or he was an educated, despotic, murderous individual, full of hatred going around, arresting all of the they were terrified of him. They were terrified of him. So Paul mentions also of his conversion, one untimely born, which means he meets Jesus two years. There's another several years go by. He goes to Jerusalem. I can imagine him saying to these individuals that he spent a few days with, 15 days total, a little over two weeks, saying, uh, tell me about the resurrection. Peter, I know John beat you to the sepulcher, but you went in first. What was it like? Well, I saw the linen wrap that was around his head. It was by itself at the at the head, and then I saw the other garments that he had been wrapped in. Well, tell me about, no, tell me when you actually first saw Jesus. Tell me on, the, on that night. James said, no, I wasn't there, but Peter and John were there. On that night, on resurrection night, in the upper room, when we had the doors locked and everybody was afraid, I want to know about that night. He comes walking in. It's a good thing that whenever Jesus appears this way, he says, fear not because you've just had a cardiac arrest. When somebody just walks through the wall, it just some, somehow, it's good to say, fear not. Do you know what I'm saying? What was it like whenever you met Jesus and he said, peace. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. And what was it like the following days whenever you met again in the upper room and then Thomas was there and said, Thomas, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna believe until I touch the nail prints in your hand and I, I put my, my hand where the, the scar was put into your side. Do you know, I, I, I don't believe that it was a negative. I don't, believe that, I don't believe that Jesus was rebuking Thomas. I believe that Jesus was saying, no, I want you to. I want you to have proof that it's me. We had a friend by the name of Jerry Cook many years ago. Well, he's pa uh, passed away several years, but uh, we knew him for many years. He was a pastor in Gresham, Oregon. And Jerry was telling about one of the morning services that he had just finished. A man in the church comes up to him after church and said, Pastor, I heard that you had just, just had open heart surgery. And he said, do you mind showing it to me? Do you mind showing me the scars? Church is over, and Jerry's a little embarrassed, but, you know, most of the people have gone anywhere. Away. So he unbuttons his shirt and lets the man trace the scars of his open-heart surgery. He said, thank you, Pastor. And Jerry said, I was curious why you would ask me to do this for you. He said, because tomorrow I'm going in for open-heart surgery. And I thought... If I could touch your scars, it would help me go through the surgery. If I can feel what you felt. Thomas said, if I can touch your scars, I want to feel what you felt. Notice the revelation of Jesus Christ. Mary Magdalene. Peter, that had just denied him. James, who spent three and a half years not even believing in him. Jesus said, Peter, uh, James, I'm not, I'm not going to ridicule you. I'm not going to condemn you. I'm just going to make an appearance just to you. This is going to be a cameo to my brother had a difficult time. I don't fault you. Come on in. 
welcome to the family. And he became the first apostle in the early church of Jerusalem, of the Jerusalem church. In Acts chapter 15, he was the spokesman in the Jerusalem church. And it was James who wrote the very first letter, even before the gospels had been written because of his revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, all of those things are good. But you know what? I think there's... See, the first of the Gospels were not written until nearly 20 years after Jesus had already risen from the dead and ascended. The first... The Gospel of John was written later, probably Mark first, and Matthew, then Luke. We know Luke was written about 30 years later, and now, and now we've, got, we've got John not writing until the last. But the, but the proof of the resurrection, yes, these guys said it, but why did they wait so long to say it? Why did these guys... Well, Paul heard them just a couple years later, though he didn't write it immediately. He heard them a couple years later, within five years of Jesus' death. He heard the firsthand, he, the witnesses that were there, he heard them say it, but he wasn't there. But how did Paul, well, that gives you the clue to the proof of the resurrection, is that he wasn't there. To have a man that was the most rebellious Man, you could possibly meet the most obnoxious. Man, whenever I meet really, really, really mean individuals, I think to myself, wow, you'd make a great apostle. <laughs> this was Paul, Saul of Tarsus. They were terrified of him, the Jerusalem church. Terrified. Even the Antioch church where he got saved, the Syrian church where he got saved, Damascus, they were terrified of him. Everybody was terrified of Saul of Tarsus. And he gets saved, and he says, I'm one untimely born, which means I wasn't there to see it. Now, this gives you a clue to the greatest proof of the resurrection. You know who it is, Sam? You. Because you once were dead, and now you are alive. Dory, do you know the proof of the resurrection? As they totally changed your life. You've never been the same. Do you know who it was, Debbie? You are the proof of the resurrection. Those of us that are untimely born, those of us that are 2,000 years later, we weren't there when the stone rolled back and the angel sat on it. We were not there when the soldiers fell over as dead. But Angie, something you have is proof of the resurrection, and that's that he totally transformed your life, Bryce and... Brandon, Johnny, totally transformed your life. He totally transformed your life. I, I can't conceive of a greater proof of the resurrection than you, than you, than you, than you, than you. The proof of the resurrection is I once was dead, but now I'm alive again. My dad was a hater of people. He hated them. He got saved in the middle of the vineyards in California, right in a row of grapevines, because he was a farmer in a grape farm, a grape ranch in California. Knelt in the dirt and asked Jesus, when he got up from that dirt, the people that he once hated, he now loved. That's called the resurrection. If the resurrection hasn't changed you, you haven't experienced Jesus. If the resurrection hasn't transformed you, the drug addicts and the alcoholics and the thieves and the murderers and the liars, if Jesus had not risen from the dead, none of those would have been born again. But because Jesus rose from the dead, I'm free, you're free, we are free. We will never, ever experience life without Jesus. We will experience eternity 
with our Lord and our Savior. Because he rose. Because he rose. Because he rose. I don't care what this virus does. He rose again. He rose again. So that gives you one more thing to rejoice about. Is that when you hear the trumpet of God sound, you're leaving this place. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trump of God shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, when his feet touch the Mount of Olives and the mountain splits. Part of it goes south and part of it goes north. The nations of the world it's because he rose again 2,000 years ago. This is the greatest message I could ever, ever share. For those that are watching that may not know Jesus, you know what it's going to cost you? Your sins. You're going to have to give him your sins, and that's all he will take. He won't take your money. He won't take your notoriety. He won't take your good looks. He won't take your material possessions. He didn't die for anything but your sins. He died for your sins. Jesus, right now, I give you my sins. They can be as high as a mountain, and in a second of time, they're gone. It doesn't take a whole lot of time for the blood to wash away your sins and to give you his righteous that second of time. I can go from being an unbeliever to a believer. From being a non-child of God to a child of God. In a second of time, my name can be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And heaven rejoices. All of the angels rejoice at just one sinner that comes home. Can you imagine today, right now, you can say, Jesus, I believe you died. I believe you rose again. Don't delay. My goodness, why would anybody delay from experiencing eternal life? Why, why would anybody not want to do it right now? I can't think of anybody that would not like to get rid of their old life or a brand new life as a child of the Most High God, full of his righteousness, full of peace, full of joy, the anxiety gone. Bondage is gone. Chains falling off. All because of the name of Jesus. The greatest proof of the resurrection is right now. You're becoming a new person. Or for those that already know Jesus, you've already encountered that unspeakable joy and peace like a river. <laughs> I can't imagine right now what's happening in homes all over this nation world. And my message and all of the other thousands of messages being preached, he is not here. He is risen from the dead. <laughs> Jesus, I am living proof of the resurrection. When I was four years of age, in a little country church, in Southern California, the preacher told me about Jesus, that he died for me. He rose again from the dead. He died for my sins. I ran to the altar and cried and cried and cried till everybody got up and left. They were ready to turn the lights out of the church. My mom said, Dad, pick him up and take him home. He's only four years old. How bad a sinner can he be? <laughs> Dad said, no, let him continue to pray until he's finished and that he will never backslide. I am a living, walking proof of the resurrection. I wasn't there 2,000 years ago, but I do know about a man who gave me new life. It has never left me. It has never left me. His love, his love has never, ever left me. We're going to pray for you. We're going to pray for people that are sick. We're going to pray for miracles to happen. I believe in these last days, we're going to see miracles like we've never encountered before. I believe it. In these last days, do you believe it? Do you believe it? Do you believe it? 
I believe we're going to see miracles. I believe we're going to see people rise from the dead. Miracles happen in his name. <laughs> miracles happen in his name. We're here, God, for you. Come and do what you do in your living rooms, in your homes right now, in your home church right now. Jesus said, if there are two or three, I'm there. So he's there. Even if you're by yourself, Jesus brought the Father and Holy Spirit, so there's still more than two. Right now, where you are, miracles. I pray in Jesus' name. You may want to pray with each other. I know we're not supposed to touch each other, but why not risk it? I know one whose name destroys every virus that has ever been concocted by hell. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Sickness, depart. Healing, invade. Those that have any kind of disease or infirmity, I speak the name of Jesus to every cell, every part of this body. I speak the name of Jesus. I curse cancer. I speak the name of Jesus. I release people from infirmities. I speak the name of Jesus. I deliver people that are in bondage. Every addiction, I curse you in the name of Jesus. Drug addiction, I curse you in the name of Jesus. Alcohol addiction, I curse you in the name of Jesus. And I set them free. What is proof of the resurrection? Johnny's going to sing it for us. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. You can rejoice with us. And after then, we finish this song. We're going to bless you. And we're going to bless your home. Sing it for me, John. Amen, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your blood, Jesus. Alone in my sorrows and dead in my sin. Lost without hope with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace. Oh, your grace. So rejoiced as though heaven had lost but then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand that's when death was arrested and my life began come on if you free sit up oh your grace so free washes over 
I want everybody to say, I am proof of the resurrection. I am proof of the resurrection. Everybody say it, every here and everywhere else. I am proof of the resurrection. And because he lives, I live. Now, can you imagine what it's like when Jesus comes back? There's not a cemetery in the world. There is not a cemetery in the world can hold people back. My dad's going to be gone. My mom's going to be gone. My older brother's going to be gone. They're just coming out of that grave. I may be here on earth when Jesus comes, but it really doesn't matter. How many know you can't, when the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. So the Bible says that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God with power in the spirit of holiness. Whenever you go through that air, you can say, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. It's worth serving Jesus. It's worth, how many know it's worth serving Jesus? I am proof of the resurrection. Don't forget it this week. I am proof. If you want to know that Jesus is alive, ask me. I have a testimony. Amen? Amen. I have a testimony. Thank you, Quinnell, for coming. Oh, my goodness. I love this guy. I love this guy. I've adopted him. He's one of my sons. We look just alike. <laughs> He's one of my sons. He lost his dad when he was eight years old, a little boy. His dad was a missionary, and he lost him. So I adopted him, so he stuck with me. It's a good stuck, though. <laughs> thank you, Brad, and thank you all for coming and joining us tonight. But we, we want to bless you in going. We want to bless everybody in your homes. So while we're blessing you, please bless others. Speak it out loud. Say it out loud. My mother used to say, how come the only time I get blessed is whenever I sneeze? <laughs> That's a good question, isn't it? Why don't we bless people? Because God says blessing and cursing, James said it, cannot come out of the same mouth. We can't curse people and bless them at the same time. We must bless people. Okay, you ready? We're going to bless people. We're going to bless them. And make sure to join us next week.
glorious favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his presence go before you 
Come on, lift your voices, lift your voice and sing. 